Well, hello everybody, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are at the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors and my name is Kevin Burke. And there is my telephone number and there is my email address. I'm usually pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, based on the attendance, I think we've got a pretty important meeting here today. So uh, again, thank you all uh, very much for being here. And so Enrico, uh, welcome back, man. Uh, okay, so uh, I have some credentials uh, that make me qualified to talk about what I'm going to talk about today. I've been a broker for a very long time um, in several states uh, and uh, in real estate for well in excess of 40 years. I'm, I'm actually almost to 50 years. Um, and uh, uh, thank you, <laughs> Mayor Burke. Thank you, Rico. Thank you. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, thank you for that. That's funny. I know people are like, how did you become a mayor? I don't know. Uh, anyway, so um, I do teach continuing education for attorneys, uh, and uh, I taught property management at the college level for quite a few years, and uh, and so that's kind of you know what we're not going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about um, leasing, but versus property management, we'll talk about the distinctions between the two. We're going to be talking about stuff that's going to appear to be legal. I am not a practicing attorney. These are all my little disclaimers. Um, my trial work is limited to testifying as an expert witness. Remember, DRE says you may not call yourself an expert except in a title. Um, and so I'm a court certified expert witness. Uh, standard of care for real estate licensees, uh, agents, duties of inspection and disclosure, and market conditions in San Diego County. Um, conversation today not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, nor for that of your attorney. Please consult with them as appropriate. Um, talk today is intended to be interactive. Uh, please ask questions or offer input by utilizing the Q&A button. Some of you have gotten really good at that already. You're doing it already today. Uh, I do look forward to hearing from you. It helps me to shape, you know, what, you know, I can sit up here and just blah, 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 talk all day long. But uh, if you ask questions, it helps me to know what, what is clear and what is not. And I can, and maybe sometimes we take a little bit of a different direction. So. So thank you for doing that. Um, and, and this morning's session was really good. I mean, I think so. Anyway, um, there were a lot of really good questions in this morning's session, and uh, it did help to um, kind of shift things, you know, away from that fearsome part that they are over to the part where, okay, I think I got this, right? So uh, this morning, we talked about the new and the revised CAR forms. Uh, this afternoon, we're talking about leases and creating that amazing lease template. Um, and Thursday morning, I get to talk about the ultimate listing agreement. So we're going to literally dive into the listing agreement, uh, and it's going to be a solid two hours. And so I'm actually creating a DRE class for that. Um, I haven't got it all done yet. I'm still waiting for the buyer representation agreement to come back. But that's at 10 o'clock on Thursday, not for DRE credit. That'll come later. Um, and then uh, in the afternoon, I'm going to show you not only how to use your tax database, it's available to you as a member benefit from SDAR, but I'm also going to show you how to uh, uh, find pre-foreclosure properties. And I'm going to tell you, that's a, a little gold mine. I mean, these properties are coming back. We have a bankruptcy attorney who's a broker in our office uh, who says, I haven't seen this many of, of these pre-foreclosures in a long time. So be thinking about what you're going to be doing for the next three years of your business. And then I would tell you that you need to have this on your radar. Um, there's a really good agent out of uh, UTC who, who says, uh, I just like to be three years ahead of everybody else. So when everybody else is, is working on the crazy sales, you know, he's working on the foreclosure. So, um, so be aware of that. So we'll talk about that on uh, Thursday. That'll be a fun day as well. Um, and so today we're going to talk about member benefits. And, and so we're going to talk about residential leases. Um, and, and we're going to talk about the, the amazing lease template. I'm going to show you how to create a template. Um, and I'm going to show you how to make it easy on yourself. And I'm going to show you why I was not having a heart attack when CAR updated 67 forms at the end of June because I knew I had them all in my template. And so I knew that I'd have all the current forms. And when I go ahead and create a lease, everything's all right in there, ready to go. OK, so some key concepts. And let's talk about that. So our subject matter today is residential leasing. The commercial class is a separate class. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody here is looking for uh, residential leases um, and also not property management. Um, property management is a separate class. So when I do the property management class, that and I'm going to show you the difference between the two, but the property management class is, is, uh, is one of those things that um, uh, it, it, it's what you do that makes it property management versus just a lease. 
Um, and again, on all this stuff, you need to be talking to your broker. Uh, check with your broker uh, before doing either one and make sure that your broker understands that what you're doing. Um, a lot of brokerages do not carry uh, E&O insurance for property management. Um, and, and, and a lot of them forbid doing property management. Um, again, I teach the property management class. I teach the forms. I do all that. But again, if your broker doesn't allow you to do it, then I would tell you, I wouldn't you know, listen, let's not get in front of the broker, okay? Because uh, the broker's there to protect you, all right? Um, as well as themselves. Um, all right, so again, residential leasing, that means no interaction with the property after the tenant takes possession. And, and we're going we're gonna to look a little bit at that uh, uh, lease uh, agreement, um, and we're going to see, because that's going to be most commonly what you're going to be looking at. Um, and I'm going to show you that, you know, what's going to happen and what is going to trigger the event that says you are done, you no longer have an agency relationship with the owner, and CAR has actually put that in the form. So it's kind of a neat thing, um, but it protects us on a lot of different scales, okay? So, so uh, but clearly after the tenant takes possession, you're done, um, and, but we'll talk about the, 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 uh, the specifics of that. So the leasing agent, once the keys are handed over to the tenant, um, in commercial we call the tenant the lessee, um, then it's over. Uh, you know, what keys constitute possession in California. They're typically keys are, are the uh, um, transfer of possessory interest, not ownership interest, because remember the tenant doesn't have an ownership right in the property. They have a, a right of possession. They have a possessory interest to do to occupy the property during their period of time, exclusive to all others, that kind of thing, depending on what the lease agreement says, okay? All right, the, the leasing agent does not answer calls about repairs. So, you know, two weeks after uh, the, the tenant moves into the property and the tenant calls you on the phone and says the water heater stopped working or some other crisis, everything's always a crisis, right? Um, at least my phone is always a crisis. Every time my phone rings, somebody's angry about something. So, so uh, you do not answer those calls or, uh, or you can't address it. You say you'll have to talk to the owner or you'll have to talk to the property manager if there is one, but you as the agent, if you're going to say you're a leasing agent, not a property manager, then you can't take those calls. OK, uh, you don't do repairs. You don't accept rent checks. I know that as management myself at one of the largest brokerages in San Diego, you know, we, we would have people walk into the office and give us rent checks. And it's like we don't do property management. So out of the office, you know, go away. Um, by the way, if you are a broker, you can uh, uh, you uh, obviously you can do what you want to do as far as property management is concerned, um, but if you are a broker associate, which means a broker working for another broker, then you need to get their permission. I had this question come to me just recently, and, and fortunately, uh, the agent uh, who had gotten their broker's license, a good, uh, a good agent, um, and working for a good brokerage, um, and I, I, I gave the, uh, the, uh, the broker associate the information they needed to have. They contacted their management at the previous, at the other brokers, still currently their brokerage, and they said the same thing. They said, you can open it up under your ticket, but separate from us, don't use our address, don't use our phone number, don't use our logo. We don't, we don't know who you are. We don't want anything to do with it, okay? All right, so, so clearly they're, they're divesting themselves from that interest. Um, you don't provide forms, and this is something that I see mistakenly done a lot. And, and so like, for example, you you lease the property to somebody. Now the owner comes to you later on. They say, uh, okay, the lease is up in two months. Um, would you please give the uh, the tenant their notice, their 60 days notice to uh, that, they're, that we're not going to renew the lease? No, you can't because you don't have a client. Now, you and you're doing property management, right? Clearly. So, so let's not do that. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but if you have questions, put it in the Q&A box. Let me know. I'm happy to answer your questions. But once those keys go away, we're done, right? Okay, to the lessor or the lessee. And, I, and distinguishing again, some people call that and say, oh, I'm a leasing agent. I don't do property management. But then they do things that constitute property management. And the Department of Real Estate is really big on this. Right. So in other words, um, you collected rent checks. You know, well, no, I'm just a leasing agent. I don't do property management, but you collected rent checks. You answered those phone calls. You did repairs. You provided forms during during a time when you did not have an agency relationship with anybody. 
Okay, that's the first of all, it's going to probably be legal advice, right, which is going to be a problem in itself. But anytime we do something, we can call ourselves a leasing agent, but anytime we do something that looks like property management, the Department of Real Estate says that is casual property management, in which case they're going to come after you like you're a property manager. And remember, property management, the number one investigated entity of the Department of Real Estate, okay? And there's a lot of reasons, and, and it's not because anybody necessarily does anything wrong, but there's, you know, they have trust funds. And so, unfortunately, trust fund, you know, we just seem to have this problem balancing trust accounts. Um, and so, you know, the trust account has to have a zero balance at the end of every month, that kind of thing. Um, but not everybody understands that. Okay. All right. Um, DRE has a position clearly. So, and, and if you want, I'll talk to you further about it, but, you know, probably off, offline. So um, if you make a mistake, um, you may not have coverage. Uh, and again, if your broker doesn't do property management and your office policy manual says that you understand that, that you're not doing property management, then you're not doing property management. Okay. All right. So as a general rule, doing real estate related activities on behalf of another in California requires a California real estate license. And that can be anything that can be sales, business opportunities, commercial leases, uh, property management. There is no separate property management license, and and in fact, I'm you know I'm thinking about the places where I'm licensed, and I don't I'm not aware of a separate license at that time at that location either. So um, they don't require a separate license. So you could casually get yourself into trouble um, because you're not thinking. Well, wait a minute, that may require a separate license. It's interesting because I'm a broker in Virginia, and and we had a case in in Virginia where the uh, the uh, Virginia agent did a real estate transaction in West Virginia, and they weren't aware of the fact that West Virginia and Virginia were two separate states. Uh, and so I thought that was interesting, uh, but, but a very poor defense. So same thing, real estate license, there's no bifurcation of the licenses. You can use your real estate license to do property management, but I would not be doing it without checking and getting something in writing from your broker that it's okay. All right. Okay. So again, we're doing leases today. That's what we're going to talk about. So that rental property owner tenant relationship, um, the rights and responsibilities of the rental property owner versus the rights and responsibilities of the tenants. And I shouldn't say versus because they're not necessarily antagonistic with each other. But the fact of the matter is, is that the owners have certain uh, uh, things that they're supposed to be doing. The tenants have certain things that they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and, and so we'll talk a little bit about that today. So some change in the term terms. We've changed some of our language. So what we used to call landlord, now it's not politically correct in California that we think that landlord goes back to medieval times, you know, the serfs and the thieves and, and all of that kind of thing. So now we're going to call them the RPO or the rental property owner. So they're no longer the landlord. I don't know how we still do the tenant. I think that probably should be changed to either a serf or something. I don't know what, right? But But so and then we have the property manager, which could also be the agent, could the leasing agent, uh, list, um, sorry, the property manager or leasing agent. Um, now we're going to call them the housing provider. So we're going to see our forms are going to change in that respect. And again, a good portion of the forms that we talked about this morning uh, were property management forms. I don't know. They're all redline version. If you want copies, send me an email. I will send you the redline version. Tell me what you want redlined of, okay? So because it's a good size package. So specific duties duties of the leasing agent. And by the way, I'm quoting the Department of Real Estate. So uh, I like to give credit where credit is due, um, especially when, you know, if you don't take my word for it, take their word for it. I think they're, they're a pretty good source uh, and, and a fairly dependable source. So, you know, here's some of the specific duties that a leasing agent, leasing, not property manager, leasing agent must perform. They advise the rental property owner, the RPO, the rents that will bring the highest yield consistent with good economics. They qualify and investigate a prospective tenant's credit, typically, right? They prepare and execute appropriate leases, advertise and publicize vacancies through selected media and broker lists. They recommend alterations and modernizations as the market dictates, like that, that green shag carpet that's, you know, that you don't vacuum, you mow it. You know, those are kind of things we might recommend that, that you know, they fix, that kind of thing. They inspect vacant space frequently. I find that this is not always done. Um, and so, unfortunately, if you're not inspecting the space, then, then there's vandalism. There's other things that could potentially happen, okay? And again, all of this, I'm quoting the Department of Real Estate. Keep abreast of the times and competitive market conditions. Obviously, be knowledgeable about and comply with 
applicable federal, state, and local laws, of course, right? Um, and the DRE requires, and this is a big one now, the DRE requires that all lease agreements prepared by the licensee, okay, have to be in writing. And that's to satisfy the statute of frauds. And again, we're back to the medieval times and all that kind of stuff. And that merely says an interest in land in order to be enforceable must be in writing. And so we are tasked with having everything that we do be in writing, okay? And I, I know they didn't emphasize that when you got your real estate license, but I'm gonna tell you something. Is, is it required that there be a lease agreement between uh, a, a written lease agreement between uh, a uh, property owner or a housing provider and a, and a tenant? And the answer is no, unless we're involved. And if we're involved, it has to be in writing. Does that make sense? So in other words, oral agreements are enforceable at law. Um, the problem is that in order to satisfy the statute of frauds, they have to be in writing. And so therefore, we are required for sure to have everything in writing. And so why is this such a big deal? Well, well, part of the reason is because we want to avoid the he said, she said, right? We want to avoid, you know, this that the agent told me this or the owner told me that. And so in order to keep that, you know, that he, and by the way, we lose in court on he said, she said, okay. So, you know, if you're taking really good notes, then there's a chance that that'll be a, a good day for you. But, but uh, in most cases, most real estate agents aren't taking good notes, but again, our agreements have to be in writing. And, and by the way, that also applies when the lease expires. And so a lot of people believe that the lease goes to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, goes to a month to month tenancy after the lease has expired. That's not necessarily true. Um, it's going to depend on the nature of the lease. It's going to depend on the terms of the lease. Hi, Jeanette. Are, are we saying hi? Or uh, do you have a, um, a comment you want to make? Or did I say something I wasn't supposed to make? Um, uh, if you have a comment or something, go ahead and put it in the Q&A button, okay? Um, but thank you. Hi, I hope you're doing okay. All right. Um, okay, so, um, um, but but remember, things have to be in writing. And so, and if they're not in writing, we're going to lose every single time. And again, I get back to that lease expiring kind of thing. I think you need to have that lease extension uh, done and it has to, yes, be in writing. Um, but a lot of people think, oh, no, you know, I'm not getting paid anymore. I don't care. Well, then you're not communicating with anybody about that property. Otherwise, you're doing property management. Okay, so um, will emails be good? Yeah, I like email. Uh, Jeanette, that's a good question. So um, email's good. Uh, Jackie Oliver, one of our attorneys on the uh, risk management uh, committee at SDA, uh, made a comment. She said, you know, emails are, are replacing certified mail. Now they're not because the law has certain things that have to go certified. Um, but, but emails are pretty good. I mean, but only if you get a response. So I'll frequently send an email. I'll send that confirming letter. Jackie wrote a really good confirming letter. Um, again, she's an attorney, a barred in four states and by the way, a concert pianist. Um, and she wrote a really good confirming letter. And so I'll usually paraphrase that and put it in an email, but I'm always going to want to get a response back so that I can at least defend the fact that they got it. OK, now, if, obviously, if we've been going back and forth for three months on the same emails and all that, and then all of a sudden you didn't get that one. Well, that's going to be a hard case for them to defend. But but I'm always going to have something that says, you know, if any of the above does not comport with your understanding of our conversation, please notify me immediately. Um, and uh, if I don't hear from you, I'll assume that uh, you figured it out. OK, so great question. Thank you. But statute of fraud says and an interest in land in order to be enforceable must be in writing. OK, all right. And that document, by the way, clearly sets forth the responsibilities of both parties. And we're going to talk about that. So when we talk about the listing agreement, we're going to talk about the responsibility of the of the broker to the client, to the uh, RPO, the owner of the property, um, and vice versa, by the way, because it's a two way street, right? Sword cuts both ways, as we say. And then when we talk about the lease agreement, we're going to talk, we're going to be talking about the uh, contractual relationship between the, uh, the uh, tenant and the housing provider, okay? So two different things. In fact, state exam question, right? Uh, in fact, in a couple of states that I can think of, because I teach the state exam, but uh, a couple of states where we actually say that the, uh, um, you know, the, the question is, 
who the property management agreement is between who, and it's usually the owner of the property, and and then tenant seems to get picked a lot. Well, the tenant doesn't have a, a, a an agreement, a property management agreement with the, the housing provider. They they have the, only the owner of the property does, and that's the question. The owner is the answer, uh, and that is the one that's frequently gotten wrong on the state exam. Okay, all right. Um, so leasing agent liability. Let's talk about that. So such obligations are going. Now, this is the leasing agent, not the property management, different, different set, of, uh, set of rules. Good faith and loyalty to the, to the principal, that's to the owner of the property or to the tenant, if they're representing the tenant. Performance of all duties with skill, care, and due diligence. Full disclosure of all pertinent facts. Uh, avoidance of commingling of funds, please. You all know what commingling is, right? Commingling is when you put your money into the account, into an account held in trust for others. So again, for co for commingling to happen, you as the real estate agent would never take the the tenant's deposit check and put it in your account. That is clearly commingling. That check belongs to the broker. It goes to the actually belongs to the owner, and 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 a lot of times it'll go via the broker, but uh, it is clearly not yours. I've had that situation where agents have had checks made out to themselves. That is not going to be a good, not going to be a good day for anybody. Okay. All right. So commingling is putting your money in with the money of others. Conversion is the opposite. Conversion is spending money that we don't really know whose was whose, right? And so you can't say, well, I had you know this much money in there, and so I didn't spend that much, so it must be their money. That's not going to be a good defense. So no commingling and refraining from personal profit. Now, by the way, it, it's okay. You're in a business to make a profit. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the, the issue is without letting everybody know, without letting the principal uh, full knowledge and consent, by the way, in writing, okay? All right, so make sure that you're getting that done. You can, you're, you're in this business to make a profit. Who knows if we ever make it, right? But but uh, we need to make sure that we don't have any secret profit, and that's what the DRE calls it—a secret profit. Is you made money and 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 without the client knowing about it, uh, and and obviously they needed to know about it. Okay, all right. Um, the agent must be familiar with the laws concerning real estate licensing. Okay, so you know when your license is going to expire that you have to take the classes and you have to pay the renewal every four years in California. In some states where I am, it's two years, um, but four years in California. So, you know, probably one of the more common calls I get from real estate agents is, you know, my license is expiring. And I go, yeah. And they say, what do I got to do? And I say, when's it expiring? And they say, Friday. And I go, you you're going to have a hard time. <laughs> we got some work we got to do. Um, so normally we trigger our agents about three months before their license expires. We send them a notice and say, hey, your license is expiring. You know, we've got this great deal. You can get your license renewed for less than anybody else. Um, and so, you know, they clearly, because if the license expires, we have to cut them. Okay. We have to sever them from our relationship. So contracts, clearly, agency, right? Fair housing, property protection, uh, insurance, landlord-tenant relationships or tenant-landlord relationships. And by the way, you're doing all these things already, I hope, right? I mean, you know, there are already things that you're required to know to do sales transactions. So I don't see the harm in doing leases, okay? Again, leases, not property management, okay? So there are some significant leasing laws out there, including AB 1482. I, I had caused to have to go through that again earlier today. Um, AB 1482 was the current governor's uh, imposition of rent controls in the state of California. First time that's ever happened in California. That just seems to be the political climate today. Um, it just is what it is. Be aware there are laws depending on where you're going to do your leases. There are different types of laws. They're changing all the time. And so this is why, you know, I'm, I'm blessed with the fact that I know when it's time to kick things up to an attorney. Um, sometimes I have to tell clients, people call me all the time and ask me for stuff. I say, you know what, I really can't talk to you about that. That's legal advice. And, and I'm not, I don't have a license for that. I'm going to have to kick you up. Here's my approved vendor list. And so I send them my approved vendor list that has a list of all the attorneys that I like to work with. And interestingly enough, most of them are from San Diego's Risk Management Committee. Okay. All right. Um, they are qualified California real estate attorneys. Okay. San Diego County has their own laws in addition to the state laws 
be aware of that. So it's kind of problematic because what can you do? It seems like a lot of times your tenant is kind of the, the jailhouse lawyer. You know, they just seem to know so much more than we do. And the answer is it's possible, um, you know, as a leasing agent, you don't have to worry about that so much. We'll talk about that in a minute, but, but you really don't have to worry about it to the point where, you know, you're, you're really just find, helping them find housing, taking care of them to what your license requires, and then moving on, right? You're not staying with that situation. Um, in San Diego, uh, new restrictions on evictions were created on the 27th of May. And so it's not that long ago, it's a month and a half ago. So it's getting harder in San Diego to evict someone uh, than it is in other parts of the state of California. Okay, all right. So again, property managers have to worry about that, but but leasing agents tend not to have to do that. Okay, because we don't do evictions. That's pretty clear. All right. Okay. What are the implications? Well, well, you know, for for breaking a law, you could risk loss of license. You could risk sanctions, which means you lost your license. Oh, and then you owe the money, right? Um, and then there's fair housing. Fair housing, unfortunately, is a possible federal offense. First of all, you should not be discriminating against anyone in any in any shape, uh, way, shape, or form, right? But but in housing, especially federal offense, right? And so like the first offense is $64,000. The second one's 128. And it just keeps going up from there. And I've never seen a case where there was only one. It's usually eight. So, you know, it can be, it, it you know, certainly, you know, I don't know if that, if people think about the, about the penalty before they do the crime, but, but first of all, you shouldn't be doing the crime. Okay. So um, it's a crime. So therefore uh, you, uh, the criminal sanctions and probably no e &O coverage, right? So you have criminal sanctions now, which could be jail time or something along that end, but your E&O carrier is not going to cover you if you break the law. Okay. All right. So, and again, I'm not saying this to make anybody afraid. I just want you to know the facts. And then that way we can work from a, a good foundation that, you know, it's not all, you know, uh, rosy out there, as we say. So loss of license, clearly. Um, tenant selection. So let's talk a little bit about tenant selection. Um, so, so screening. So you as the licensee will normally pick up the process of screening the tenant to see if they're a good fit for the owner. Now, I've heard several different variations on this theme. Uh, do you, you take the first tenant? Uh, do you put them all in a pool and then let the owner decide? Again, with leasing, it's a little bit easier. In property management, the property manager is usually making the decision. But in leasing, we normally can kick that up to the owner. Um, and, and in fact, San Diego's got, uh, San Diego Association has a, a good program um, uh, called Smart Union. It, it's uh, uh, associated with TransUnion. Um, and so for credit reporting purposes and stuff like that, we personally don't want their social security number in our file. Um, but, you know, they, they essentially, we have them go to the screening company, the tenant, they go to the screening company, the screening company reports to the owner, um, as well as to us, you know, what they think, you know, is it a good risk, not a good risk, that kind of thing, <clears throat> all done all done by data, all done by research that they do, the tenant pays them directly. So we're not handling the money, you know, is this something that needs to go in the trust log, you know, stuff like that. So, so uh, I like that program again. Um, I had somebody recently who wanted to use it. And I couldn't find it on the website, but fortunately, membership uh, at SDAR.com was really good about sending them the link to being able to do it. I don't know why I couldn't find it, but then I'm not as bright as most. So it just is what it is. But I like the program. I use the program. It's a good thing. Um, my screen just went away. Did yours? No, good. Okay. Um, all right. So screening again, you know, we've got all the fair housing issues. We've got all the things that we need to be concerned about. Um, it's best not to require photo ID until after the decision has been made to lease. Um, and so, and why do we say that? Well, because photo ID contains a picture. Uh, and so what? So, uh, you know, we, we had a lawsuit recently in San Diego, the, uh, um, the, a, a buyer of a property wrote an offer. There were 11 offers on the property. Um, the seller chose another offer. Um, the buyer, though, had sent over uh, what we used to call a love letter. Now it's a buyer interest letter. Um, and the buyer sued the seller for taking another lower offer, by the way. The seller took the lower offer because the person that they sold it to worked in their company and they just felt like that was a good bond. Um, but the buyer, the buyer that sued took offense at that. And then, of course, the buyer's uh, claim was, you know, you, you can see that we are... Um, uh, 
you know, we are a different color than you are. Our daughter's in a wheelchair, you know, uh, uh, disabled. So you discriminated against us based on race. You discriminated against us based on uh, disability. Um, and so we're off to the, to the races, no pun intended, okay? So, you know, so I probably would not get a photo ID. And yet in the old days, that's what we did, right? Even before we showed property, we'd get a picture of their driver's license and leave it in the office in case I don't come back. This is the guy that kills me, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the way we used to do it. But I probably wouldn't do that today, okay? Um, make the decision and then get the ID because you need to have something in case you've got to chase them later. Um, potential fair housing accusations. All tenant applicants complete the same application. So, so and, and why do I say that? Because it, it used to be that husband and wife, for example, would complete one, one application. They would do it on the same application. Why? Well, the credit's the same, the bank accounts are the same, all that kind of stuff. Well, no, you know, we've realized that, you know, they, uh, that that discriminates against non-married couples. Um, so now everybody completes their own application, and by the way, the same application. Don't give you know application A to this person, but application C to the other person. Everybody's got to get the same application. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, I do a lot of leases. I do hundreds of these constantly going on these things. Okay. All right. Take good care of your landlords, by the way. They tend to be sellers later. Okay. Um, on a separate application form, uh, on separate application forms for each applicant. So I think I made that pretty clear. Credit report. So uh, it is a criminal offense. It's a federal offense to pull somebody's credit report without their written approval to do so. Okay. Prior written approval to do so. Um, so so just like everybody gets their own application, everybody who's going to be on the lease must also have an application, must also have a credit report pulled. Don't discriminate against people. I'm not going to pull your credit because you look good or, or something like that. That is not going to fly. OK. All right. So but again, a federal offense. And so I just had this happen recently. My brother uh, and uh, his wife uh, uh got a loan on a property. And before they had found the property they wanted to buy, um, they their credit was pulled. And so I asked them, I said, did, did you, so they, they had told me they hadn't signed any forms or anything, but they just went ahead and pulled their credit. Well, that's against the law. And so sure enough, they managed to get a pretty good incentive from the lender for not reporting the lender, uh, because usually that Fannie Mae 1003 form, that's the form that the, uh, the traditional loan application form has a, a space right on it that authorizes the credit being pulled. And so again, be really careful about that. It's a big deal. It can be an expensive offense, okay? All right. Um, and so, again, you must have a separate credit report for each applicant over the age of 18. You want everybody who's going to live in the property over the age of 18 to be on the lease agreement. And that assumes, of course, over, uh, you know, for, for greater than 14 days. Um, and this is really important um, because the law is going to treat people in the property differently if they're on the lease agreement versus whether or not they're just a guest. OK, and so you want everybody on the credit report. Um, and, I, and I know I get, you know, I, I've had uh, I've had situations. I had a, a I had a guy that had unbelievably good credit, um, probably one of the worst tenants I've ever had. Um, and so and it was all I could do to get rid of him. He was just such a pain, um, a heart surgeon, no less. Um, and so, you know, so I'm going to tell you that credit is not necessarily the end of all of things. All that is, is, is a propensity to pay. That means they're more likely to pay than maybe somebody else would pay, right? So we don't want to give it too much credit, no pun intended, but I've, I also had a tenant. I had a, a, a lovely couple, married couple, who, who came to me. Who uh, They had 16 pages of bad news. If I tell you, I told them, I said, you should have this bronze. This is amazing credit report. I've never seen one this trashed, right? And so they came into my office. They sat down for four hours and explained every single line item in that credit report and how it happened. And it turned out that they were from a small town up in uh, uh, Central California near um, uh, Santa Barbara, um, and the family owned the town. Uh, and uh, and this was the typical. This was the Romeo and Juliet. These two wanted to get married, and the family 
forbade it. Um, and so they got married anyway. And so as a result, the uh, family just trashed their credit, you know, trying to maybe produce, through, I think we're seeing some of this happening today in, in politics. But, but anyway, the bottom line was that the, uh, 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 the credit, you know, they explained every single thing in there. They turned out to be one of, I took them. They turned out to be one of the best tenants I've ever had. They referred people to me. They referred sellers to me. Um, and in fact, about nine months later, um, he loses his job at the auto dealership in Kearney Mesa. And, and I wrote him a letter of recommendation to the new landlord up in San Bernardino. Um, you know, just a great tenant. I just, they were, they were, but again, trash credit. They were a better tenant than my guy with the impeccable credit. So, you know, always be aware, folks, that the credit report is is all that is, is the likelihood that they're going to pay. Uh, don't don't take it necessarily. You need to be calling past landlords. Um, and, and by the way, be careful what you ask past landlords. So, you know, you can't say things like, uh, you know, were they a good tenant? Um, you can say things like, would you rent to them again? Um, things like that. So I, I'd be careful about getting into details, but there, there's like the do's and don'ts of what you can and cannot say when calling past landlords. The most recent past landlord is the less credible, right? Because they're the ones that if anybody's trying to get rid of them, they're the one trying to get rid of them. Okay. So I usually call the second one back, the third one back, uh, and then see what kind of story I get. Okay. All right. Um, so I have always said that if you want to understand real estate, the forms will teach you. Um, and so this is obviously we're going to make our segue into uh, the forms themselves, um, the lease or rental agreements. Um, so I want to ask, does anybody have any questions about anything I've talked about so far? I'll give you a second to think about it. And it gives me a second to get a drink of water um, uh, because I'm going to go into the forms now. OK, OK, we're good. Um, so anyway, not all the forms, obviously, but but think of it as a tree. So on the lease or rental agreements, think of it as a tree. All of the other forms are going to flow from either of these two choices. So as you go through the forms, you will see things that will reference this form, that form. Well, OK, those are going to be need to be included in your transaction, right? Uh, question, um, any place to have the most current law? Now, what does that mean, Jeanette? Um, most current law. Uh, the good news is that you don't give legal advice. And so... Uh, so you need to know what the law, roughly what the law is, but you never want to tell anybody what it is. And so I always tell people, you need to talk to an attorney about that. Um, I, I had an attorney buying a house for me and he says, uh, he said, you know, it was, it was a same sex couple. This is 20 years ago, same sex couple. And, and, uh, and one of them was an attorney. The other was an oral surgeon. Um, and they, they asked me, you know, how should we take title to the property? And I said, I don't know. Well, I teach it. But but and so they went and I said, you need to go look it up. Here's a bunch of resources for you. They went and they looked it up and they came back and they said, here's how we're going to take title of the property. I said, good for you. And they said, you knew that all along, didn't you? And I said, well, yeah, but I can't give you legal advice. And you're an attorney. You know that. Right. So, you know, it just is what it is. Uh, so hopefully I answered your question. There's a lot of really good resources. I'm trying to think, is it 1492? There's a lot of. Uh, 1452. There's a lot of really good legal resources. The ones that re are relevant most to you, as far as uh, leasing is concerned, are going to be found on the form. Anytime you see anything citing a statute, that's where you're going to, that's where your, uh, your direction needs to go to look it up. But again, not to give legal advice, but just for your own understanding of it. Um, Rico, is, is e &O insurance more expensive when you accept funds? Um, Okay, so your broker probably doesn't allow you to accept money from others. Uh, our contract got away from that too. Back in 2012, we got away from the uh, uh, the collecting of, of uh, earnest money checks, for example, um, checks for deposits, you know, things like that. Those are the kinds of things we want to save between the the. Uh, rental property owner and the tenant. Um, we usually, once once you get to a point where there's a check going to be produced, 
we like that money to go to the owner directly. We don't touch it. We don't want to have to maintain. Remember that the law doesn't require you have a trust account unless you're handling the money of others. Um, but the law, the Department of Real Estate does require you to have a trust log. Um, and those trust logs can be found on their website. Even CAR doesn't have them anymore. So, you know, you want to refer them. You want to usually we have them send the check directly to the owner and then and then we just invoice the owner. Um, e and O insurance. Anytime you're handling money, E and O insurance is going to be higher. Um, to keep up with the current law, like a rent cap, yes. Um, and again, the laws are changing constantly. Um, there's a lot of really good law firms out there. A lot of whom will give you, uh, you know, free email publications and things like that. I can think of one uh, just recently, uh, BPE Law Group that we had speak to uh, our expert witness forum. Um, at uh, CAR uh, in uh, September, or, no, when was it? It was uh, April. Um, really good group. I'm on their mailing list. They send stuff out. I just look at the stuff that I'm interested in, uh, and uh, and that helps me uh, to form, you know, my basis of my uh, my uh, thoughts on, on different issues that are associated with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, law according to Reynolds. But but again, since you know it's 1482, if you're concerned about rent cap, go to 1482 and look at it. I mean, and 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 so again, they have to tell you when those are going to change. But CAR is going to be your best resource for when those laws change. And so keep attuned to that. Um, uh, we have a property management forum. I know that our next meeting is in, uh, what, September 18th through the 20th, 20th I think it is. Um, and so there, there's a property management forum. There's a legal forum on property management, things like that. I suggest that those are good things to go to. It's right here in Anaheim. Can't miss it. Um, so hopefully that helps Jeanette, but if you want more specific references, send me an email and I'll, I'll handle that. <clears throat> Thank you, Rico. Yeah. Anytime you accept money from others, you're just going to be paying more money, uh, in, in insurance. Okay. Um, and, and again, you know, uh, um, so <laughs> this happens all the time in property management, for example, um, the, uh, the person handling the funds, you know, has to either have a license or be bonded. You know, there's a lot of requirements on that. Um, and so you want to be really careful that that you are following the letter of the law uh, and, and more, more appropriately, the intent of the law when you're dealing with other people's money. OK, so again, all forms flow from either of these two choices. Uh, we're going to have a listing side. We're going to have the leasing side. Um, on the listing side, we're going to have the listing agreement. And that's the form LL. Um, and so let's let's go take a look. I want to get into some of these forms because this this stuff is the the, the fun part of all this. Uh, where's my uh, link, Linda? Okay, here we go. Um, I'm looking for. Did I get logged off already? Oh darn it. Okay, hang on a second here. Uh, we're at CAR's website. I'm gonna have to sign in really quick. I might not have signed in yet. And part of the reason is because it signs me out pretty. I wish they would give me a longer time period because I'm on this all day, right? But sometimes I, I go on to do other stuff, you know, the 12 windows open on my computer and I don't actually get back to it in time before it logs me out. So uh, I'm going to go up here to my uh, templates. Um, and, and here's uh, part of the reason behind this is that I have several templates and we're going to talk about templates in a minute. But uh, when I look at my templates, I look and I see that I have my, um, uh, where is it? My, here's my property management template. Uh, here is my lease template. So we're not going to do property management. We're going to do leases. So let me pull up my lease template. Notice it says June of 23 because I updated it, uh, it uh, at the end of June so that I knew that I would be uh, compliant. OK, everybody good. All right. So this is my template. So again, as I promised you, I've broken it down into several sections. Now, again, why do I create a template? Karen, hi. Karen, question, Q&A field. Question? Uh, you can't see it. Ah, oh, that's, I know that's what you're about to say. Uh, there we go. How's that, Karen? Karen, does that work? I think that's for probably what you were, yeah, I can't see it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Karen, but thank you for letting me know because it's kind of, I, this morning I got on to something and forgot to look. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, I have another computer over here, here that I can see 
what you can see, but I got to remember to look at it. Okay. So, okay. So everybody okay here now, this is my template. Um, this is the template I created for leases. So now when agents in Linda's office do leases, they use this template. So they create a new transaction, they, they give it a name, and then they apply this template. And then as a result, they get all these forms in it. Okay. So, so, um, Leases don't have nearly as many forms, but they can get us into much more trouble. Okay, so let's look at the listing side. And you can see right here, uh, I'm going to click on the listing side of my uh, template. Um, I've got my agency disclosure. Now, why don't they include the agency disclosure in the lease listing agreement? And so let me pull up the lease listing agreement. I'll show you what is included. So here's what the lease listing agreement looks like. All right, we're going to go through this. I'm going to, we're going to just knock this one out. But notice there was no agency disclosure up at the top of the page. Okay, so, so why not? Well, let's take a look at the agency disclosure and that'll explain to us why not. So here is my agency disclosure. And the very first thing it says up here at the top, this form is being provided in connection with the transaction for a leasehold interest exceeding a year. So agency disclosure is not required for leases of less than a year. Now, all you're disclosing is the concept of agency. I think you need to have your head examined. I shouldn't say that, but, but I think you need to be doing agency disclosure in all of your transactions, right? Why? Just because it's not required by law doesn't mean it's a really good idea, okay? So I do this. I always do the agency disclosure. So this is included in my template, all right? So this is because I want to talk about it and they didn't, we didn't change the language. I mean, in the old uh, version of the agency disclosure, it said seller, landlord, buyer, tenant, um, you know, they didn't carry that all the way through. So, but it is the same thing. Okay. So if this is a transaction for more than a year on a lease, civil code 2079, that's the civil code that regulates you and I requires that you have this. So now if it's six months, tell me what's the harm in you providing an agency disclosure? I don't think there's a harm in it, okay? But but on the same token, does is it a benefit? And the answer is yes. You've disclosed the concept of agency. I think it's a good idea to do it, okay? All right. And I'm not, so I'm, obviously I'm I'm telling you that from an educated position. I think it's a good idea, okay? So there's my agency disclosure. Again, always the first form I ever have the client sign prior to uh, doing a transaction. Let's go back now to my uh, lease listing agreement. And again, notice the date six twenty three. Um, and so be very, very careful. Make sure if you're creating templates, and, and I'm going to show you how to do this in a second, but when you're creating your template, if the template <clears throat> is in the template folders, right, then CAR will update your template. OK, so they will they will change the forms so you can see I just opened this up for the first time, my lease template, and it's got the 623 version. OK, previous to that, it had the 1222 version. But when the upgrade occurred in, in uh, the end of June of this year, um, they automatically uh, uh, updated all of the forms that I had in the program. Does that make sense, everybody? It's a very, very important concept. Now, what they didn't do is they did not add new forms. Okay, so I'm okay with that because I know there were only four new forms, right? Remember, the class, if you were in the class this morning, you know that the contingency removal for the buyer, contingency removal for the seller, the uh, RPOD, which is the real uh, the uh, rental property owner disclosure. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and then the uh, RUPA, uh, which was the residential unit purchase agreement to be used in commercial or vacant land transactions. Those are the only four. So, you know, again, uh, only the RPOD applies to my leases. All right. So this is my lease listing agreement. All right. And, and so now instead of doing it the way that we normally do things, they're going to a lot of the forms that that you are currently uh, using in your purchase agreements are going to be located down at the bottom instead of the top. So here's my fair housing and discrimination advisory down towards the bottom. Um, and then uh, underneath that, my Cal California Consumer Privacy Act advisory, which did update in, in December of 22. Um, and then uh, let's see, I think that's it. Yeah. So that's all I've done. I, I don't see the wire fraud advisory. I've added that in my template because I really kind of think the wire fraud advisory is a good idea. Um, but we're, we're here today to talk about the lease uh, agreement, so the listing agreement. So we're going to talk about the listing agreement, then we're going to get into the, uh, the leasing agreement, and I'm going to show you what, what changes. So remember, again, this you must have an employment agreement with 
the owner of the property in order to be to receive a commission and clearly in order to be able to represent them. OK, otherwise, anything you do is legal advice. And so we don't want to do that. All right. So this is your employment agreement. In fact, here's the language right here, employees and grants. And, and that's the required language. OK, I wish all that language was also in the buyer representation agreement, but they're OK with it for at least for the moment. So, you know, again, here's my document. I check my my date up here at the top. To make sure it's the current form. I've got my date prepared. That's going to be the date I put it together, just like your purchase agreement. Right. And then I'm going to have the name of the rental property owner. We've clarified now that that it's not the landlord anymore. Now it's the RPO. OK. And so here's the brokerage's name. I'm showing you our templates so you can at least get an idea, you know, what goes where the beginning date and the ending date. So how long should your listing agreement before that? Check with your broker on that. Um, we do ours for six months, but some people do them for three. Some people do them for one. Some people do them for two weeks. Um, you know, so you set up whatever you want that to look like. Uh, typically, when we do ours, we'll have it start. Uh, so, for example, this is the 18th of July. We'll have it start today and we'll have it end on the 31st of December. Uh, December 31st is the most common expired date for listings. Um, why? Because nobody wants their listing to go into January uh, because then it starts to look like a really old listing. <laughs> so, so normally, and, and we follow that, but we've got really good client control. So, you know, when, when we take a listing, we know they're going to relist it uh, on January 1. And so right around middle of December, we have them sign a new listing agreement that starts uh, in uh, 2024. Okay, so there we are. We're already at 2024. Everybody good? Okay, something just moved on my screen. I don't know what it was. All right. So anyway, so whatever that beginning and end, any date you want it to be, um, the exclusive and irrevocable right. Yes, that's how you pronounce it. Irrevocable right to lease or rent. And then I'm going to have the property address here. Um, why? Because I have to have a subject matter of what we're doing. Um, and by the way, this top part are called the recitals. So whatever you fill in up here tends to carry over to all the other forms. Okay, everybody good? All right, that's paragraph one. Okay, so uh, paragraph number two, I get into my listing terms, right? CAR likes to set these up so that paragraph three is always about compensation, you know, things like that. Now, they weren't able to do that with the new buyer representation agreement, but, but all the other forms say the same thing. Any questions about this so far? Okay, so listing terms, a rent amount, whatever that is, Again, this is assuming you're taking the listing. Rental amount per what? Month, day, year. Security deposit, you got to put it in there in order to be authorized to collect it. Type of tenancy, whether it's month to month or one year. Most agents do year because they like to get paid on the gross rent normally um, versus uh, you know doing it month to month, in which case they got to chase everybody around for the money. Uh, question. Um, Victoria, hi. Uh, what if you're representing an elderly family member that has a property he wants family members to advertise for rent who will eventually inherit the property? Since he cannot be involved in the advertising management of the property and wants his family to do this, what do you recommend with respect to lease agreement and responsibilities? Okay, so first of all, if um, you do not need a real estate license to buy or sell a home of your own. Anytime you need a license is when you represent others. So uh, elderly, not elderly, um, he wants he wants the family to do that. I've done it. Um, I had uh, my mother passed away. Obviously, I'm the uh, family representative for uh, my mother. And so um, I'm able to advertise the property um, because I'm selling it on her behalf for her estate. OK, now, ultimately, I, I listed it with a brokerage firm um, and uh, he said such a kind thing at the end of the transaction. He said, God, I can't believe how much I learned from you. And I went, well, I appreciate that. But but this is in Arizona. And so, uh, you know, it's common law. So uh, um, anyway, but my job was to represent the family and represent the estate. So so to answer your question, Victoria, um, they can represent themselves. Um, that's not a problem. You don't need a real estate license to represent yourself. Um, you only need your real estate license to represent others. Even if I own a property and I do, I own property in other states, I can represent myself buying and selling, not as a licensee, but as a uh, as the owner of the property. I can do that. Or a family member uh, of the property. I can do that. Okay. But if 
if I do have a license in those states, and in some of them I do, then I must also indicate in my advertising that I am a real estate licensee. Does that make sense? So if this individual wants to rent their own place out or even manage their own place, there's no law that requires them to list it with a real estate agent. Am I answering your question? Uh, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear about it. <clears throat> um, uh, he cannot be involved in the advertising. Sure, he can. Management of the property wants his family to do this. What do you write with respect to the lease agreement? Yeah. Um, again, um, if you now, uh, so if you are um, the person advertising the property on behalf of the family member, then you must disclose your license status, but you must also check with your broker as to your broker's policies as to whether or not um, you, you need to uh, list it within the company. I have transactions right now that I'm doing uh, for real estate estate agents who are employed by other brokers, um, but their brokers are forbidding them to sell their property. So, um, so that happens. Okay. So a uh, great question though, Victoria, good question. I, I, I teach the broker classes in, in Virginia and California. I'm a certified instructor in, in Virginia. And people ask me that all the time. They say, well, what if I want to buy a property in, in Vegas? Go for it. You don't need a real estate license. You can buy property yourself, right? Um, and if you have a license in Virginia or if you have a license in California, wherever you have a license, you can collect a referral fee, right? <clears throat> but it has to go through the broker. Okay. All right. Great question. Thank you for asking that. That's a really great question. Let me see if I can get this uh, to minimize this. Nope, it's not going to go. Okay. All right. So uh, we talked about uh, type of tenancy, items included in the lease. And so I'd be particularly careful about this. You know, what what items are, are, are going to stay? I had a, a, an owner on a property in Del Mar who, who um, was renting the property out fully furnished. I mean, it just had everything in it, including a a, uh, a chessboard made out of crystal, and uh, and and so sure enough, first tenant, you know, breaks the head off of the king and a few other things, and and so it was like, I told you not to leave that there, but make sure you get that list. So, and I always have the owner fill it out, and I tell the owner, you know, if you miss something, you may end up disappearing. You're not going to have any recourse because we're going to have the tenant sign off on this um, when they uh, come into the property. Okay, so personal property that will not be maintained. Uh, or replaced. A lot of times that's my refrigerator, washer, dryer. Um, items excluded from the lease. In this case, he excluded the garage. Good example for us on a lot of these things. He, he didn't want the tenant parking in the garage. He had a BMW in there, but he had a lot of valuables. Um, and so literally he locked the garage on both sides. The tenants could not get into the garage to uh, park their vehicle, much less go through the garage looking for things. And so again, it was an itinerant rental. It was, you know, uh, a vacation rental kind of thing. Okay, all right, uh, what uh, else in here? Additional terms, if any, um, I threw in there. So paragraph number three, and I love this, the amount, the dollar amount or the rate, which is the percentage of commissions is not fixed by law. And the DRE requires this, okay? They're set by each broker individually. And then my favorite word is they may be negotiable between the RPO and the broker. And so anytime the client starts to give me grief uh, and they never do because they know I'm just a fun guy, but you know, if they were to give me grief about commissions, I say, hey, you better be careful because it doesn't say that that means negotiable, it means down, it means up. And so uh, normally they realize, you know, they're getting, you know, I, I, obviously I go into that appointment with a lot of confidence. Um, and so, and, and that's just something you build over time, but uh, I never have anybody quibble with me over commissions, but uh, 44 years, there must be some secret, right? Maybe I just look mean or something. I don't know what. Um, so anyway, commissions include all compensation and fees to the broker. That is very, very important. So if you've got a TC fee, any of that kind of, anything you want to collect needs to be in here. Um, and by the way, the Department of Real Estate says, we think the TC fees are junk fees. We think that's what you should be paying those fees and not putting them back on the client. That's just from their their lips to God's ears, as we say. Um, so I have to put in a commission amount. I can't leave it open. Um, I put in an arbitrary figure in there. Um, and uh, Or it could be, uh, and again, that's for gross rents, right? So the total rent. So gross rents, or it could be a dollar amount, or it could be whatever. Um, or there could be additional compensation for something. Um, I took over a listing. Uh, actually, I ended up co-listing a property with another broker who uh, had taken a listing uh, for a very low fee on, on their end, which was significantly less than I would do it for. Um, but but the owner was paying $5,000 a month for marketing. Um, so they were spending a lot of money on marketing the property, and they figured that was going to be the lion's share. So the agent took the listing thinking that that would be okay. Um, and so that's all right. Whatever you do, got to be in writing, got to be in here, okay? Um, 
so my fixed term lease, that's the first one. Then I have my month to month, whatever that's going to look like. It tends to be less than a year. Um, but for either one, I've got, um, you know, if there's an extension or anything like that, then I'm also entitled to be compensated. Paragraph uh, number three, um, you know, so what is this now? 3AC or 3AB is going to be what we refer to on the state exam as the safety clause or the protection clause. And that's the part that protects the broker from having, you know, the prospective tenant come around after the listing expires, you know, the tenant and the owner get together. And then, and then they say, well, look, this expires on Wednesday. So on Thursday, we'll put our deal together. Well, that's what this clause is intended to prevent. And it's actually a state exam question, okay? Um, so again, without going through it word for word, because we're going to run out of time, because I want to show you how to create this. Um, so what else? In addition, if there is anything else, they agree to pay some other figure, if any. And then we've got, uh, are, do you want to be compensated in the event that the tenant purchases the property? I see agents filling this in all the time. Um, but remember that you know the, the owner has agreed to do that but they have not signed a listing agreement uh, on the owners on the uh, on the sales side of things. So I don't know how enforceable that is, but uh, OK, um, but I see people doing it. I just saw one uh, on a property up in uh, L.A. Um, people do it. OK, but is it enforceable? That's going to be up to your broker. Right. All right. Um, uh, so so in F, we talk about how much of the gross uh, uh, commission that we're going to receive that we're going to give to the other agent. And so I tell people all the time, I never see these split in half, almost never. So what do we have up there? I think we came up with what, 6%, 6%. So then you would think that that in the MLS, it would say 3%, but it says two and a half percent. And so this is actually fairly common where, where the agent, you know, well, they were willing to work for two and a half percent. So, you know, but again, commissions are not, you know, commissions, but as the buyer's agent or as the tenant's agent, uh, just like uh, the buyer, I, I did not have the ability to be present during the conversation about commissions. And so I'm stuck with whatever the uh, uh, the uh, seller's agent or the, uh, in this case, the landlord, the uh, RPO's agent has uh, agreed. They have to put it in writing in here. And one of the, re we actually added this clause probably about 20 years ago because we were seeing so many agents not being fair you know, whatever that is, I, I don't know. I, we always say fair is a place where you show pigs, right? So, you know, Delmar Fair, you know, like it's a place you show pigs. So, but but now the contract says you have to put in how much the you're going to pay the other side so that you've notified the owner of the property how much that's going to be, okay? So fair or not fair, whatever it is, you just put in whatever that number is going to be. Tenant payments, so where are the tenant payments? So as a matter of default, all the monies go to the RPO. Again, this is a lease. If it was a, uh, a lease listing, if it was property management, then they'd all go to the broker. Okay. All right. Um, one of my favorite things is my direct electronic rental payment. I advise against it. And here's why. If the RPO permits to pay rent by direct deposit, um, you should be discussing with a landlord tenant attorney the implications of doing so in the event that a tenant defaults and an eviction becomes necessary because you don't have the protections that you have with that check coming in. Does that make sense? OK, and then there's that wire fraud advisory that was not attached. I don't understand why we didn't attach it. Right. Uh, key safe lockbox. So in, in a regular listing of a house for sale, we have an agreement in there as to um, the placement of the lockbox. Remember, you may not put a lockbox on a property without consent. So now we have a tenant property, we need to have additional consent by the tenant. And since the tenant is not part a party to our listing agreement with the owner, we're going to have the tenant sign that additional KLA. And that says the same thing. It says, we don't have insurance to cover your toys. You know, you're, you're kind of on your own. Um, in fact, in our, our lease agreements, we ask the tenant to get insurance to cover the uh, to cover the uh, owner as additional insured. Um, sign, we want to sign MLS, security insurance. Uh, again, as I said earlier, we don't have insurance to cover your toys. So uh, I've seen the most bizarre things at, at houses that I've gone through on open houses and caravans and stuff. And I've seen guns on dash, you know, guns up on dressers, knives, uh, pictures that I probably wouldn't have put up there, money clips, you know, things like that. I'm just astounded at what people leave out of their homes. But uh, I don't know, I'm not that way. I don't leave stuff around. Um, so um, ownership, title and authority, nobody else has any interest in this property. Um, and, and you got to watch out for that because sometimes like, you know, mom gave us the money to buy the place. So she has an ownership interest in it. And so even though it's not on title, she may still have that interest. Okay. Um, all right. What else? 
brokers and RPOs duties. I love this part. Um, this is the kind of stuff that I have the lawyers write out in, in column or format so that they get an idea of what it is that we do for a living, right? Um, and so, uh, blah, 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 blah. what else? Anything else in there exciting? Agency relationships, we gotta talk about that, right? Uh, and so um, we're confirming agency. Um, interestingly enough, we don't have a separate paragraph for that in the in the uh, in the listing agreement, but we because there is no confirmation of agency until the lease comes in. But uh, I'm trying to remember now if we have it there. We definitely have it in the purchase agreement. Okay, so uh, uh, so let's talk about our termination of agency relationship. Okay, and again, uh, um, that unless the RPO and the broker enter a separate property management agreement, which then would continue the process, the broker will not represent the RPO in any manner regarding the management of the premises. We're telling you right now we don't do property management. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Now, RPO further agrees that the representation duties and the agency relationship, very important, with the broker terminate at the earlier of either entering into the lease agreement, okay, and if checked, tenant occupancy, delivering to tenant the keys, that's the one we check, tenant walkthrough, completion of move-in inspection. Um, there is no CAR form MIMO anymore, now it's the MI or the MO. Um, so another little boo-boo that they're gonna have to fix. Um, okay, uh, and if no lease is already entered into, then the expiration of this. Now, why is that important? So like, I'll get that phone call from the buyer, a buyer's agent, for example, saying that the seller's agent is soliciting my client. And I'll say, has the transaction closed? Is it recorded? Yes, titles transferred from the seller to the buyer. Okay, you no longer have a client. So they're not soliciting your client. They're soliciting a member of the public like they would anybody. You know, they're not, it's not your client anymore. You don't have a client. And that's what this says right here. This says that at this point in time, then I no longer have an agency relationship with that person. And again, any advice you give them after that is gonna be legal advice. So we wanna be careful, okay? Attorney's fees, interestingly enough, we're gonna have each paying their own attorney's fees. Um, and that's the push. That's where everything's going now in the CAR contracts. And part of the reason behind that is that we wanna discourage litigation. We want people to work things out. And that's what comes up in the next paragraph is that we really want you to attempt, attempt mediation. And so mediation always first. And if you do anything to go around that mediation, then guess what? Um, the prevailing parties in Tyler recover attorney's fees, notwithstanding provisions paragraph number 14, okay? So, so in other words, if, if you should have mediated and you did not, and you filed a lawsuit instead, and you pursued forward with the lawsuit, then guess what? Uh, and you lose, the other side gets all of their fees, not, not you know, and you're going to pay all of that. So, uh, so my advice is mediate first, okay? And so again, that's going to be a broker decision, um, but that's our dispute resolution, what we'll call ADR, which is alternative dispute resolution. Everybody good with that? Really important. I've got cases on that where the attorney was hired, it was a general practitioner attorney, did not know real estate law, did not know what the contract said, filed the lawsuit, proceeded forward. Now, they can file the lawsuit, but only as a notice of pending action. And that says it right here. The filing of a lawsuit to enable the recording of a list pendants is okay, but they continued with the lawsuit. They ordered discovery. They started doing a lot of stuff. And of course, you know, and, and I'm involved, right? And so it's like, guess what? You're not going to get your fees. Um, so uh, then other crazy stuff happens. Um, okay. So um, uh, you could also have arbitration. And I, I, you know, all of our listing agreements, all of our employment agreements, we've taken the arbitration provision out of it. So these agreements are still between the buyer and the seller, but we don't have them, or the uh, landlord and tenant, but we don't have them in our listing agreements anymore. And part of the reason was the brokers were, you know, being compelled to arbitrate when they didn't want to arbitrate. So, you know, their agent would commit them to being going to uh, arbitration rather than going to trial. I'd rather go to court. I love it in court. It's a, it's my sandbox, right? So, but but here here my agent goes and commits me to doing arbitration. I don't want to do arbitration. I'd rather have the jury of fourteen than have one individual making a decision who who is is the arbitrator. The you know in that case that trier of fact. And so, um, and in arbitration it can't be appealed either. So uh, um, you know there's a lot of issues with all of that. Just so you're aware of that. But so again, check with your broker. Does your broker want the arbitration agreement? If so, please follow your broker's advice. If not, don't do it. Okay. Management approval. So management has five calendar days after uh, execution of this agreement to approve or disapprove of the agreement. So something's wacky in there that they don't like. They've got five days. 
But remember that you are required by law to get it to the broker within three days. Why? Because that gives them two more days to decide whether they want to take it or not. Okay. The broker can say no, right? It's an important concept to remember. And so, um, but if you don't give it to them until after the lease is completed, then, then, you know, they don't have that right. And so, so that's why the DRE requires you to get it to them within three days. Now, companies can make that time period less. In our office, we do one day. Um, and, and that's because, you know, we do everything in, in, in Dropbox and Google Drive and stuff like that. So, you know, you, you have the ability to get everything to us within a day. You don't need three. Now we've got four days to decide whether we want it or not. Okay. All right. Equal housing opportunity, additional terms. Again, the RP, and again, this is the listing agreement. So the RPOD is going to be the disclosure that you're going to give to the tenant. The RPOQ is the disclosure between the owner and the agent. And then, of course, we have our FHDA, our Consumer Privacy Act advisory, our agency disclosure. I check it because we're going to use it in our office. Uh, and then the KLA is probably going to be used as well. Okay, question, uh, Victoria, are the disclosures, additional terms necessary if you don't have a lease listing agreement and you're doing this for yourself? Um, so again, are you a real estate agent or not? If you're a real estate agent, the law is going to require you to make certain disclosures. Um, so uh, are they necessary um, under additional terms? Um, I would put them in there just to bind them in or have them part of the agreement. Um, but a question is, do you even need the listing agreement? Again, if you're leasing it for yourself, you don't, right? But uh, I probably would, and your broker probably requires it. Um, we require it. If one of our agents wants to lease their property out or list it for sale, uh, we require them to have everything in writing. It's because the DRE requires it. So, uh, so, so kind of the answer to your question is, um, uh, uh, if you don't have a lease listing, if you don't have a lease listing agreement, then I'm assuming that you're you're not an agent. Your contract with your broker probably says that you have to list all your properties through your brokerage. OK. All right. Um, hopefully I answer that one. Uh, I'm not going to get into contract law and all that uh, entity rental property owners. Uh, and then uh, obviously the company name and all that kind of stuff. And then we get into the rest of the stuff. So here's the rental property owner disclosure. Again, this is intended to be provided to the tenant. Now, I'm sorry, uh, back that up. This is intended to go between the owner and the management company. OK, um, so or the owner and the, and the listing agent. All right. This is not the one that goes to the tenant. And that's why they put that up here at the top. OK. All right. All right. So that's my RPOD. Again, they made it in such a way that it looks like the SPQ. I really like what they did here. Uh, are you the RPO aware? And so then we're going to go through some of these are statutory. Some of them are contractual. Lead based paint, clearly statutory. Methamphetamine, clearly statutory. You know, so again, we, we have an obligation. The owner has an obligation to complete this to give it back to us. And so you see from the gray fields in there that when you send this file over to the owner, the owner will have the ability to fill out these fields. You should not be filling these out for, for the owner. But again, previous uh, above this, we saw all kinds of stuff that you can fill out, right? But when you get down to this, this is the one, you know, you obviously you want uh, this information at the top to be completed. Um, but then all this stuff that's gray, this is all stuff the owner fills out. Okay, everybody okay with that? All right, and then, and then here's the rental property owner questionnaire. And again, this is intended, uh, uh, what did I do here? Did they give me two versions of the same thing? Uh, the RPOD, and this is the RPOQ. So uh, property management and not with a residential lease. That is so backwards. What do they do? Oh, that's funny. We've caught a couple of mistakes today, right? Okay, so this, the disclosure is um, with the residential lease. The questionnaire is uh, not with the residential lease. There's my difference right there, okay? All right. Same form, really, for most purposes. Uh, a couple of additional items in there. Um, my fair housing discrimination advisory, I showed you this already. Uh, okay, so that's that's it. Any questions on the uh, on the listing side of things? And then I want to get us into the uh, leasing side of things. That seems to be the one that most everybody's really interested in. Uh, where did it go? 
Um, so in that case, we're going to be doing a lease application, right? And so this is the form now. This is now known as the application to lease or rent screening fee. Because remember, if you're going to collect a fee, you have to have it in writing, get permission in writing, okay? Um, so again, completed by the applicant, separate application to lease or rent is required for each occupant 18 years of age or older, could be an emancipated minor, 17 years old, military service, emancipated minor, could be a, a, an adjudicated uh, emancipated minor. Uh, I left home at 14. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be doing contracts with people. There was no harm and no crime for me to do it, but for them, it would have been unenforceable against me. But again, they were doing me a favor. So I signed a lot of contracts from 14 to 18 years of age uh, and uh, nobody ever questioned it. I guess I always looked older than I was, but uh, again, contracts is what the parties think it is, but we've got some really bad cases where, you know, the, 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 uh, somebody tried to enforce an agreement against a minor and it's not going to work because the court says they weren't, uh, didn't, they lacked capacity. Okay. All right. So we have all this information. We want them to fill this all out. Um, so for example, um, have you ever, where was the one I just saw in here? Um, have you ever been a party to an unlawful detainer or filed bankruptcy within the last seven years? They can't say, have you ever been evicted? Okay, they can ask you these questions, all right? So have you ever been asked to move out of a residence? Um, so they can ask you these questions, okay? Resident history, employment history, you always, always, always want to get this completed by the tenant and you want it to be pretty complete, right? Uh, and they'll always skip the part about the bank. No, 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 the owner wants that. So we want to have that in the file. Um, and then... Uh, uh, down here, they sign that, you know, everything above is true and accurate, all that kind of happy stuff. And then down here, we talk about, uh, here's the smart move I was talking about earlier from TransUnion. Uh, so smart union by TransUnion. Um, we have them pay that directly. We don't uh, get any money off of that. Um, they did raise the amount you can charge for a screening fee. Uh, it's up now. It used to be like $30. Now it's up to $52 um, that you can charge, um, but you need to give an accounting. So uh, that's important to remember. Um, and uh, again, we don't want their social security number. Uh, and so that's my lease rental application. And then here's my burn form again, you know, that we're going to do a background check on you and we're going to find things out. I can find out pretty much anything about anybody. Um, sometimes I have to do it by zone. So Southwest versus, you know, Chicago or something like that. Okay. All right. So that's my application. And then let's go ahead and talk about the lease itself. And then I want to launch into how to create these things for yourself. So uh, this is my residential lease or month to month rental agreement. Um, and again, uh, this one's uh, this one's going to be fairly lengthy. So uh, let's see here down here. It's going to be nine pages on its own. And then there's the ancillary documents. So uh, uh, any questions about what we talked about so far? OK, good. All right. So um, I'm assuming you know, that, that uh, you just don't have any questions or not that you're not listening. So residential lease or month to month, that's my new RLM, LRLM form. Again, please make sure you're using the current form. All right. So the date, that's this date, whatever it is that you're creating the document, date prepared, tenant's name, could be more than one. If it's two, if it's three, I'm going to use the ASA form, which is the additional signature addendum. Okay. Um, and then the property owner, um, whoever that is, um, if I'm if I'm the management company, then I would fill that in. But uh, let's just say that this is going to be an agreement. You're creating an agreement between the tenant and what was the landlord is now the rental property owner. OK, could be the authorized broker, could be the property manager. All right. So, again, um, here's my address of the property. Uh, and I want a list of everybody who's going to live in the property over the age of 18 for more than 14 uh, days, right? Okay. Remember, as I said earlier, the law treats them differently. And that is a lot of things about that. Evictions, for example, if I don't have everybody, now I got to figure out who the other people are. Um, so evictions, uh, slip and falls, things like that. The law treats differently if somebody has an accident on the property, if they're in the lease agreement versus if they're just living there. OK, and so you got to be careful about that, because a lot of times the one with a really good credit comes to you and, and applies for the application. But your lease agreement is going to say that if anybody other than that guests are not permitted to stay. Right. Uh, anybody, uh, any person in the premises other than those listed in the paragraph are considered guests and they're not allowed to stay for more than 14 days without being on the lease agreement. OK. All right. Um, 
personal property being made, whatever, refrigerator, washer, dryer, whatever. What's my commencement date? What's the date of the beginning of the lease? So I might fill it out today, but the lease doesn't start till August 1, right? So then August 1 would go in here, okay? So it begins on August 1. And then I have my, you know, is it going to be month to month? Is it going to be a lease agreement? I'm going to probably make it a, a year's lease. Uh, question, uh, why would you put management name instead of the owner themselves? Um, well, because a property management company manages properties on behalf of another. And so the property, the owner may have several properties. Um, the property manager may be handling multiple properties. And so, but the, but the property management company has been authorized by the owner to represent the owner. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. If it doesn't, let me know. Um, so, uh, what's the rent going to be? Uh, it's going to have to be a static amount, figure out what that's going to be. Rent is payable on the first of the month. I usually put in zero. Uh, I usually put in the first or uh, uh, I put in zero because, you know, it's always delinquent on the next day. And this is something a lot of people don't understand. A lot of tenants think that there's a five day grace period. There's no five day grace period to law in California. OK, so it is what you put in the contract. And my personal feeling is that if I give them five days, they'll take the five days. So if I give them five, you know, the rents due on either uh, the, the first or the fifth day of the month, invariably, now I'm waiting to see on the fifth of the month if it's going to show up on time. So I just do the first of the month. And I sit down with my tenant. I say, here's the deal. Rent's due on the first. I serve you on the second. And so I tell them that, right? I never have to evict tenants. I don't understand. But I'm very clear with them what our relationship's going to look like. I, the rent's due on the first. I serve you on the second, which means you didn't get the rent in on the first. So I'm going to file a, a, an action to get you out of the property. Now, I know it sound, maybe it sounds harsh, but I also take really good care of my tenants. And I have tenants saving me 15 years. I have so many 15-year tenants. I've had tenants move out of one of my places to be with me to move into another place that I own just so they don't lose me. So, you know, I take really good care of my tenants. There's always going to be that problem tenant out there, but I just, I always have this conversation at the very beginning. They're going to have to make a decision whether or not we're going to love each other. Are we going to do this transaction or not? And so, you know, I, I'm not going to play games, but, you know, I am going to serve you and I will get rid of you. And so, and so I make it very, very clear at the same time, if something's wrong, I want to know right when it's wrong, I'll have somebody on your doorstep in less than 24 hours. Okay. All right. And, the, and that's the relationship that I have. The name of the management is on the lower part of the lease. The name of the management. Where are you looking, Jeanette? Uh, the lower part of the lease. Are you talking about down at the bottom? Can we get to that when we get to it? Uh, I don't see what you're talking about. Okay. All right. If you think of it, let me know. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, uh, this, this next paragraph uh, prorations are, are usually in, 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 uh, in a banker's month, they call it. So a 30 day month. So yeah, okay, there's 365 days in a year. So you've got five days, you know, but no, it's a 30 day month. So even in February, by the way, um, on the 1st of February, they pay the rent for 30 days. Okay. All right. And when we prorate, we prorate it based on 30 days. That's what that means. It's called a banker's month uh, payment. Here's how the form is. You're going to accept it. They have their, their pluses and their minuses. Um, I don't do PayPal. I don't do Venmo. Um, I've had really bad experiences with them. Um, not, not them personally, but with payments by those processes. Um, we had uh, our bank, I won't tell you the name of our bank, unfortunately, that we do business with, has said that, you know, when we had somebody putting money into our account on a Venmo thing, and then we didn't have, we don't know who they were. Um, and so the, the, the bank said, if we find out it's one of our customers, then we will seize your bank account. I mean, I have a lot of money going in and out of that bank account every month. So you're going to seize my bank, my funds because of somebody else's mistake. And then they were very clear that that's what they were going to do. So we just do not accept PayPal. We do not expect, accept Venmo. Um, that's just our thing. You do whatever your owner wants to do. Uh, some of our owners, I have owners who just insist on, they love the electronic stuff. Um, but remember, um, that there are some issues that are going to happen if you do wiring money rather than um, 
uh, checks. You don't have the protection of the NSF laws, for example. So if a payment is re returned for non-sufficient funds, um, then you have other things that can happen. But unfortunately, what happens if you didn't have a check? What happens if it was an electronic payment? You may not have that protection. Security deposits, almost always an issue. Always forward those, have those sent to the owner unless you're doing property management. Okay. So let the owner keep it, right? Um, and then uh, uh, then, then paragraph number four B talks about the conditions associated with that um, security deposit shall not be used by tenant lieu of the payment of last month's rent. And yet it's in bold print for a reason because they tend, tend to seem to want to do that. Um, so, um, and then notice that there, that you have an obligation at law to within 21 days after the tenant vacates the property, the owner has an obligation to give either back the deposit or an accounting thereof. Essentially, that's what that's going to say. And though, for those of you, I think, Jeanette, were you asking earlier, here's my civil code 1950, um, got lots of good stuff in there. Um, so, uh, so again, you either give back the deposit or an accounting thereof. If you give them back part of it, then accounting for what the money was kept for, things like that, okay? Um, security deposit, now this is interesting, will not be returned to the tenant until all the tenants have vacated the premises and all the keys have returned. Okay, so here I am back to my keys again. Um, and, and the check is going to be made out to all of the tenants, uh, not uh, or, or as subsequently, subsequently modified. So I've had that happen where I had five tenants. And so, you know, we require one check to move in. And when we're moving out, we're going to give you one check and it's going to go to this person unless I get some kind of a writing from everybody. And I tell them that. I say, you know, everybody sent me something that said it's okay to give the check to, you know, each person individually. But otherwise, it's going to go to the person that gave me the check in the first place. Everybody okay with that? All right. Uh, no interest will be paid unless required by law. Uh, if the security deposit is held by the owner, et cetera, et cetera, um, let me see, blah, 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 I'm, I'm trying to hit the highlights here. Um, uh, down here, the maximum amount of security deposit, no matter what you call it, the maximum amount cannot exceed two months rent for an unfurnished premises. So it's two months for unfurnished, it's three months for furnished, okay? Um, in addition to any rent for the first month paid, that's why we never say first and last. OK, um, it doesn't prohibit the payment of advance rent, but it has to be for more than six months because the law says, well, you did it for three months. So you're really just trying to get around the, the rule. Um, and so they don't like that. So it's got to be at least six months rent. OK, I've had people pay a whole year in advance. Um, I had one guy in Del Mar pay a whole year. My client owned the property, was a judge, um, and the uh, tenant uh, had an unlawful detainer uh, like a month earlier, at, right up the street. And so I asked them, I said, well, why didn't you just pay your rent? They said, well, it was the principal of the thing. And I'm like, okay. He said, the place smelled like cat urine, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, so he said to the, he says, I'll, I'll give the owner the whole year. Okay. But remember, if, you, if they give the whole year and then they have just cause to get out of the lease, then the owner may have to disgorge that money. So, you know, I don't know. I don't really care for those year long payment in advance, um, only because I find that the owner has spent the money uh, and nobody explained that to anybody. OK. All right. So just so you're aware of that uh, late charges, return checks, we have to tell them, you know, late right here, zero calendar days. OK, um, we charge six percent of the rent due. Twenty five dollars is an NSF fee. All right. Uh, these are all standard charges that we charge. Um, okay, uh, what else? Parking. You got to tell them if they got parking or not. So in this case, parking is permitted, um, and it's there's no, and it's included in the rent. But it could be not permitted, or it could be not included in the rent. You could be charging extra for parking. I've had owners do that. Same thing with the storage. Storage is permitted usually within the interior of the unit. Um, and it is included in the rents, that kind of thing. Um, and then paragraph number nine talks about utilities. So we want the tenant to pay all the utilities and maybe some additional stuff that, that they may not be aware of, but maybe not the HOA dues, for example, okay? Um, uh, or we may have a separate agreement for that. Everybody okay with that? Um, look at this. Uh, uh, housing provider is only responsible for installing and maintaining one usable telephone jack. Does anybody use a landline anymore? Uh, and one telephone line to the premises. So uh, interesting. Uh, tenants shall pay the cost for conversion, et cetera, et cetera. So then we have our water submeters. Um, and, and again, we have our gas meters if they're separate, does not have a separate gas meter, electric meter, same thing. What are the conditions of the premises? So, you know, we're going to have the tenant let us know what the condition of the premises are. We don't want to have them let us know two days before they move out. 
we want to know right away. And so what do we do? We normally check the box that says that you're going to give us a, a, a list of things that aren't working within three days after commence, commencement. So after you move in within three days, maybe we check this box, maybe that's a new deal. Um, but but again, we want, we're want we going to probably give them that MI form. Here it is, MI form. Um, and and we're, that's usually the box that we check. So we want them to give that to us within three days of, of putting it all together. If we don't give it, if we don't get it from them, we're going to assume everything was fine in the property. And then of course, at the end of the lease, if anything is not fine with the property, we're going to, we're going to ding them, ding their, their uh, uh, deposit for it. Okay. Maintenance use and reporting. Again, let us know if things aren't working. Um, I've seen some owners try to put the uh, smoke uh, alarms and carbon monoxide detectors back on the tenant. I don't think that's a really good idea. Um, you're responsible for that. Uh, tenant shall water the lawn, maintain the garden. I find that it's usually prudent to pay half the water bill. And, and part of that reason is because tenants tend to disable the rain bird, you know, turn off the automatic sprinkler system. So I like to, to uh, participate in the, in, the, in the money for the water so they'll continue to water the property. So I'm gonna have to speed it up a little bit here. Um, personal property, uh, gratis and without warranty of condition. Uh, in other words, we're not gonna fix it. Uh, what else? Uh, I always tell a tenant, go to the property at night, make sure it's where you're going to be able, if you're a night sleeper, make sure you're going to be able to sleep. Animals, now I'm into my uh, code uh, 54.2, no animals, that's the default, unless we use the animal terms and conditions addendum, which, which we talked about this morning's class. Um, I like that form, it replaced the pet addendum. Uh, I thought it was a really good form. I like the uh, ATCA better. Smoking, no smoking is allowed on the premises. Um, and or it can be only the following substances, you know, things like that. But by default, no smoking on the premises. Um, that's that's a heck to get that out of the uh, property. So uh, rules and regulations, if there are any, the owner agrees to provide the tenant with those within 10 days normally. Um, and by the way, it probably would give them the HOA rules as well, because you know, the homeowner association may have rules, um, you know, uh, regarding uh, the tenant's use of the property, like no dry cleaning businesses out of the garage, stuff like that. OK, so uh, um, alterations and repairs only with permission of the owner, keys and locks. I usually do it upon commencement. It's going to be usually two keys to the premises, one to the mailbox one of the common area. If you don't fill that out and it turns out you gave them a common area key and they lose it, or you can't prove that you gave it to them, they, they can be expensive, like $250 or more. Um, and it's just an expense you don't necessarily need to have. I'm gonna check the box that the property has not been rekeyed unless I know for a fact that it was. Um, and uh, entry, photographs, internet advertising, signs, all this. No assignment or subletting of any kind. Um, that includes parking spaces, et cetera, but we just don't allow it. Um, and that includes short-term vacation rentals. We'll have people, you know, pay a, pay a month, you know, a, a rental on a property and, and, you know, it, it rents for say 5,000 a month. Yeah. But they, but then they go and they sublet or they do a, a Airbnb or whatever, and they're able to get 10,000 a month and they pocket the other five. Well, you have to have that provision that says there is no assignment. Okay. All right. Uh, all tenants are jointly and severally liable. Um, possession, uh, usually the owner is going to get possession within a day, um, within, but they have five days. So I know you want to get in there on the first, but we're not going to give it to you on the fifth. So watch out when you're signing these things. Um, tenant's obligation. Again, the tenant only has to put, give the property back in broom clean condition. So we have an addendum in our agreement that says that they will have it professionally clean, including windows uh, and provide receipts for that. But again, we give it to them that way too. We don't ask them to give it back to us in better condition than they were given. So we have it professionally clean, including rooms, you know, cl including windows, et cetera. And then we expect it back in the same condition. Uh, what else? Uh, all this uh, legal stuff. Uh, I, I mentioned insurance earlier. So paragraph number 29, we require them to have $100,000 worth of insurance. I think I'm gonna raise that to 250, um, uh, not, not 2,500. So, um, you know, the, the uh, insurance requirement is gonna be 250 and we want them to name the property manager or the rental property owner as the additional insured. Um, Waterbeds, portable washers. I don't know what the fixation is with waterbeds. They 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 have about as much uh, 
pressure on the ground as a refrigerator does, but okay. Um, make a big thing out of that. You have to fill in where notice goes. Okay, you have to let everybody know where the notice goes. So whoever the housing provider is, whether it's the owner, the property manager, the agent, whatever, um, again, if you're not doing property management, your name should not be in here unless you are the owner. Um, and then the tenant is usually the, the, the place where they are, are occupying. Um, Karen, so regarding non-subletting for Airbnb, can you repeat where it's clarified in the lease? Yes, Karen, thank you for asking. So I'll scroll up a little bit here. So um bu -bu 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 -bum. up here paragraph number 22 under assignment and subletting uh specifically pair uh, uh, 22b um also applies to short-term vacation transient rentals uh such as but not limited to airbnb vrbo home away or other short-term rental services okay is that okay karen um Definitely the default says, no, you will not. Um, I don't know why you, as an agent, you would check the box, doesn't apply. I don't know why you would do that, but okay. I imagine some people do. Uh, okay, tenant estoppel certificate, one of my favorite things. Anytime you put a tenant in a property, I would have them uh, provide a TEC form immediately within three days after moving in, because that's the document that says, here's the whole lease, the whole, this is the lease, the whole lease, and nothing but the lease, so help me God. And so you, you want their signature on it. You want the owner's signature on it that says that, hey, you know, this is the entire terms. That way, you know, the tenant's going to fill the form out. They're going to say, it's my washer dryer, you know, and then that way, when you go to sell the property, you're not uh, giving away the tenant's washer dryer, which you don't have the authority to do that. So I would get that done right away. Um, I've had cases where the tenant claimed that the, they had a greater deposit than than the owner uh, claimed that they had. So if you get that TEC form right away, tenant estoppel certificate, they didn't write it out here for you, but uh, oh, here it is down here, but that's a great little form. Every time you take a listing with a rental in it, uh, every time you write an offer on a property, make sure if you're using it, writing the offer, you have the TOPA form, which is the tenant occupied property addendum, and that calls out the tenant estoppel certificate, okay? All right, uh, let me see what else. Um, there's my mediation again, same rules before. Um, and then there's my uh, attorney's fees. And once again, prevailing part. Now, what we've done here is we've limited uh, to a reasonable attorney's fees uh, and costs not to exceed a thousand bucks. I mean, they charge you, I charge them a thousand bucks to talk to me, right? I mean, I charge them 1500 just to talk to me, okay? So, uh, so this is CAR's attempt to quelch the litigation. Um, I like that feature. 10 degrees to it, run with it, right? Okay, keeps it down. Um, disclosures, here's all my disclosures again. Again, remember the law requires that we disclose the existence of the Megan's Law database, not that we go to the database. I recommend against going to the database. Okay, everybody good with that? All right, um, ba -ba -ba. always include the residential environmental hazards booklet. I'm going to show you in a minute where it is. Now, I know in sales transactions, we get used to the fact that they're usually provided by the Natural Hazard Disclosure Company. Not all of them do, by the way. Double check on that. Make sure the one that we use very clearly does. Um, and it's saved us on a number of occasions because the law requires it in sales and rentals. So we have separate forms for that. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. OK, um, and then I have my flood hazard disclosure. We have a form for that. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that. And then it's going to be down here underneath all this um, uh, time of essence, et cetera. Confirmation of my agency, paragraph number 41. Termination of agency. Again, this is on the lease side of things. So uh, the, the uh, obligation terminates upon the last to occur the following, either tenant occupancy, delivery of the tenant the keys. When I'm giving the keys, I am over it, right? I'm done. They've got it, okay? So uh, that's what that's all about. I'm no longer their agent, okay? All right. Um, and again, in rentals, at least, the, the tenant has a right to receive foreign language translation um, and not necessarily at, uh, uh, well, actually the, the law uh, requires the housing provider or the property manager to provide them with a foreign language translation. We don't do them anymore. Um, we used to do them, but we stopped doing them. So I don't know why we still require it. But um, anyway, uh, don't you be the translator, okay? Uh, let's see here, receipt, um, uh, 
if specified in paragraph number five, <clears throat> housing provider or broker acknowledges receipt of the move-in funds. I have all my little forms that I like to check in here. Uh, and then uh, notice tenant flood hazard is by default, bed bug disclosure by default. Those are statutory rent cap statutory okay so the other ones that i have checked are, are not statutory uh and then we have our legally authorized signer much like what you saw before with the uh, entity uh, tenant uh versus the entity housing provider you could have a guarantor now what a guarantor does is a guarantor guarantees the lease so they essentially if the if the tenant doesn't pay the rent they guarantee that they're going to pay it all right. Uh, so, um, you know, sometimes yet you've got maybe somebody that you don't trust 100 percent or whatever. And so you want somebody else to be on the hook for it. That's kind of what that's for. All right. And so I would have them also sign the lease agreement uh, with the tenant. OK, uh, housing provider signature here. The brokers do all their thing. Um, and then I get into my bed bug disclosure. And so basically, if the owner is aware of bed bug uh, issues, then then um, they are not actually allowed by law to re-rent it until they get it fixed. So, but the tenant has an obligation to report it and stuff like that. So uh, that's bed bugs. Tenant flood hazard. I talked about this this morning. I have checked the box. You can see it in my template. My box says the property is located in a special flood hazard area. I would rather tell them it was in a tenant flood area than not and be wrong, right? So if I tell you it's in the flood hazard area and I'm wrong, no harm, no foul. There's no lawsuit. But if I tell you it's not in the flood zone, and in fact, it is in the flood zone, then I'm going to probably be paying some extra money to somebody. And I'm not interested in doing that. So by default, our box is checked. It says it's in the zone. OK, then they have this really cool little nifty little website that you can go to to look it up. It points you to the San Diego one. Again, I don't think agents should be going there, but you end up doing it anyway. But the owner should go there to see whether or not their property is located in the zone. Um, and so, again, this is a tenant. It's a statutory obligation, a tenant flood hazard disclosure. OK, all right. Normally, those are handled by your natural hazard disclosure companies right but but in this case you have to do it so here we go rent cap and just cause addendum again my uh, qcrea uh, qualified california real estate attorney um, so you know in most cases um, the the box here needs to be checked notice of exemption i'm not giving you legal advice but check with your broker, but I'm pretty sure um, that uh, 1947 doesn't apply. But again, please confirm that um, unless you're a, a REIT, a real estate investment trust, a corporation, an LLC, uh, in which at least one member is a corporation, right? Okay. All right. And nothing else to do on that form. It's all right there. Okay. All right. It uh, gets into just cause, no fault reasons for getting rid of tenants, stuff like that. Again, this is the state law. This is not the San Diego law. OK, fair housing discrimination advisory. Yeah, absolutely going to be included in all of our transactions. Um, and then they've added to this, and I'm glad they have, information on dampness and mold for renters in California. So, you know, that just looks ugly, right? Uh, I bought properties that had that in it. OK, uh, uh, I don't know if that's statue botrys, but but it looks like it might be. But again, I, I don't I'm not a you know, I haven't run a sample. Let's just say that. So you want to be careful about saying because because there is no standard. There's no bottom of, of this stuff. You know, everybody has a different reaction to it. OK, so uh, um, sometimes, you know, I've got water, obviously water leaking down the bottom. Um, this is uh, going up through the whole house. Um, through the to the ceilings and all that. Uh, so, you know, what do you do to fix it? You definitely don't wipe it down with a, a cloth with Clorox on it. Uh, I had I had an owner do that on a property I was buying from. He was just spreading it around. I mean, it was just, oh, my God. Um, so anyway, I, I didn't notice offhand any reference to statue botrys. But, but anyway, so we tell them all about all this stuff. This is part of the document that they're going to sign. Is everybody good with that? Um, so what I want to do in the time I have remaining here is I want to show you how to create a template. So again, what you need to do is and we're going to go back to our list. OK, so here are my templates. So I'm going to go up into here uh, and move myself, move myself out of the way. I'm going to go up here to where it says templates. OK, you see that templates. I'm going to uh, I'm going to click on it. I'm going to go over here where it says new. So let's do this together. But what I'm going to do for you is send me an email because I don't know who wants this or not. Send me an email. I will send you a copy of our template. 
Okay. And then you can just put it into your program, change, you know, where, wherever you see my name, put your name, you know, stuff like that. Okay. Um, check with your broker. All right. But I'm going to click on new. And so, uh, so then I go over here and I see new lease listing. Okay. I'm going to use that because I haven't created it as a, as a default template for anything. Um, so I'm going to use that and in the creation of my template. Okay. So a couple of things, what am I going to call it? I'm going to call it my lease class template. I'm calling it that. So I'll be able to identify it and delete it later because I don't, I'm not going to need it, but, but what's it for? It's going to be residential. It's a, it's a required field. It's got an asterisk. Okay. Um, don't worry about over here. You're not running the broker version of zip forms or anything like that down here. Do you want it to apply to new transactions? Uh, do you uh, automatically, or I'm sorry, do not want it to apply? Do you automatically want to apply it to lease listing or residential new transactions? I'd probably say yes, um, if that was your intention. Um, but you clearly don't want to have it apply to all transactions because then every transaction you do is going to be a lease. So I wouldn't do that. So is everybody good so far? I give it a name, okay? And this is the template, right? So, um, and then I'm gonna uh, attach it to residential and then I'm going to not automatically apply it. I'll just have to remember to do it later. And then by the way, here's all my templates, right? So I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and save it the way it sits. Is, did everybody follow me okay with that? So now I, I'm, I'm left with a, a blank transactional part of things. So here's what I would do next. Okay, I would go over here to all forms right, to my library, uh, California Association of Realtors, I'd click my all button, I would go down to lease, okay, why, because it's going to pull up all my lease agreements, all right, so these are all the forms, there's not a ton of them, I'm going to apply the cover sheet, okay, uh, I'm going to apply an addendum, I know I'm going to use an addendum, so I'm going to cl click on addendum, um, amendment of existing terms. I don't know that I'm going to need that, but there's my uh, ATC form, right? My uh, ATCA, my animal terms and conditions. I'm definitely going to have that in there. I'm going to definitely have an application to lease or rent form, right? One for each applicant, different, okay? Uh, bed bug disclosure, I don't need to add it. I've already seen it's attached to the lease agreement. Um, uh, what else in here? Let's see. Um, uh, maybe my denial of rental application for credit. I think I'll remember that I have it. I'm just looking for stuff that I need. Definitely going to add my disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships, right? Remember what we said? So I'm going to add that to it. Um, we don't do, actually, exclusive authorization. I can't believe we put that back in there. Exclusive authorization for a vacation rental. We don't We don't really uh, uh, recommend those anymore. Um, fair housing, that was included in the lease agreement. Um, let's see, uh, interim occupancy, no, lead-based paint. Yeah, I'm definitely going to do lead-based paint, right? Because because why? Because if the property is built pre-1978 and I don't make that disclosure, I think it's up to like $44,000 per offense. So make sure you're aware of that. Here's my lease listing agreement. Uh, here's my lease rental mold and ventilation addendum. Uh, what else do I have to have in here? My move-in inspection, my move-out inspection, uh, my uh, notice regarding background investigation is already included in the lease agreement, right? Uh, notice of entry, notice and change of turn. These are things that I don't necessarily need. I'm, I'm kind of a minimalist right now. I want to do as less as possible. Uh, what else do I have to have in my agreement? Uh, pool, hot tub, and spa addendum, whether community or individually. Um, and then uh, we're not doing property management, receipts, reports, perhaps, stuff like that. Here's my rent cap and just cause. It's already included in the lease agreement. Uh, and then I have my RPOD and my RPOQ. Both are included in the agreement. Uh, and I don't need my RCSDs. Everybody follow. I know I'm doing this fast, but I'm trying to get it done uh, for you and actually get you out a couple minutes early. But my residential lease, my RLMM, for sure, I want that in there, right? Uh, and then my tenant estoppel certificate, I definitely want that in there. Um, where's my uh, tenant occupied uh, property addendum? Oh, that's interesting. We didn't put that in there. Huh. We got the estoppel certificate. Tenant flood hazard is included in the lease agreement. What else? Anything else in there exciting? Uh, if I use the current forms, I don't need any of these. So that's really all I need. I mean, the basics, okay? So, you know, I've got the basics of what I need in here. And again, I want to remove, uh, where was that one that I added that I wish I had the uh, exclusive uh, vacation rental. So caution about deleting things. My recommendation is you never delete anything because if you delete it, we can't get it back. 
Okay, so be careful what you delete. All right. Um, now, obviously, I know what I'm deleting here, but but because I, I know I don't need that in here, it's not supposed to have been a form that even worked anyway. But so anyway, I create. So I've created all the forms. Now I go through my cover sheet. And I'm showing you how to create a template. I go through my cover sheet. I don't know the tenant's name because I don't know who that is yet. This is a template. I don't know the owner's name. Um, I don't have any of this information. Although I've, I've I've asked them repeatedly, why don't you just put California in there? Right, because you know this is the California. This is forms for California. It's not for other states. So, okay, what else do I need to know? Uh, uh, probably residential, right? Uh, escrow. I don't need escrow. Um, buyers brokers information might be me, right? Um, so, but I may be the seller's broker. So, you know, I'm going to put the company name in there. There it is. Okay, I'm going to put the company's license number. So the reason I'm filling all this out, 019, this is 019775787. The reason I'm filling all this out is so I don't have to do it later. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to show you why, because I'm, I don't need lender, I don't need appraisal, I don't need title, I don't need pest control, I don't need disclosure, I don't need home warranty, I don't need any of this other stuff. There may be a TC, we just added this to it recently. So I've created my template, and I, and I went into my cover sheet to do it. Now, one of the things that I tell everybody to do is go in here to parties and fill out who the parties are. So obviously, you know who you are, you would fill that out, okay? All right, so I've created my lease class template. And so anybody have any questions? It's obviously not complete, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm going to send you this one. You send me an email and I'll send you this one. Okay, so this one's as complete as it's ever going to get. Okay, for now, anyway, until they update the forms. Okay, so, um, so now I've created it. Anybody have any questions about how I created it? I want to show you now how to use it. All right, so I'm going to go, I've got my little, it's called lease class template. I'm going to go over here to transactions, and now I'm going to create a new transaction, right? So it's going to be a new lease listing. Follow me. Click on new lease listing. Uh, I've got to give it a, a street name uh, or a name of the transaction. I don't have to put a property address in there. I'd recommend it. I do have to put a category. I'm going to call it residential. Okay, I don't have to put a picture. It's not necessary. I'm going to call it active. Um, they're going to make you answer whether or not to do rent spree. So if you're going to say, <coughs> so, you know, yes, no, whatever you prefer. But if you don't answer it, they're going to pop it back up. So you got to answer the question. So, all right. Now, what template do I want to use to create the transaction? So I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to find my lease class template. That's the one I just created, right? And then I'm going to I go down here where it says save. Okay, I'm going to click on save. And now what's it going to do? It's going to create that new transaction. Here's the name up here. And I go to documents and here's all the documents I just used to create that that template, right? So it's all filled out. Now all I got to do is go over to my cover sheet and then fill that out. So now I probably do know the owner's information if I'm leasing it, if I'm taking a listing on it. Okay, I clearly know uh, the address now. Um, I can fill all that out. So I populate this form because it populates all the other forms. Is everybody okay with that? I showed you how to create the template and then I showed you how to apply it to a transaction. Well, well let's say for example that I don't like that what I did now I want to apply the big template. I want to apply the real template. And so I'm going to look for, uh, hit the drop down. Whoops, that's calendar. Uh, where's my form? I'm creating a transaction. Where am I? Uh, back. Okay. Okay. So from here, I hit the drop down area arrow. I go over here. If I love the transaction so much, I'm going to save it as a template. Okay. Um, but I want to, um, where's my uh, apply template? Uh, that's funny. I'm not seeing it. Okay, so here it is right here. So see where it says apply template. I, I just decided this isn't enough. I want to apply the big template. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to apply the lease template from June of 2023. Now I hit apply and watch what this does. So this is going to go ahead and apply the big template. Okay, you see what I'm saying? Here's my folders over here on the left. Here's my uh, transaction uh, in the middle of the, of the whole thing. If I want to get into the lease packet, I click on lease packet. And I've got all this. By the way, we do buyer representation agreements with tenants because we just don't like getting paid 50 bucks or 100 bucks. The tenant usually agrees to pay us you know, uh, what we feel like we're worth. Um, and, and that's based on whatever we find them. OK, so uh, I just remember there's no there's no minimum or maximum commissions in, in the MLS. It's against the law. I actually have that. So. Uh, 
so we're usually going to uh, have the tenant uh, agree to compensate us for helping them find something. Okay, so can, can, this now contains all the stuff I put in there. Notice what I said earlier about my environmental packet. And so again, you, you count on those natural hazard disclosure companies to do your environmental packet for you. Not all of them do, but they'll do it for you if they do it in a sale transaction, but you're not using them in a, in a, in a rental transaction. So on the rental transaction side of things, here's my six forms, okay? So I'm gonna apply all of these forms um, and I'm only gonna use a probably, if, it, if it's not an earthquake safety issue, then I won't use number four or number five. I don't need the report filled out. Here's what the report looks like. Um, but if I, you know, if it's not, an, if it's not built pre-60, then I don't, uh, seller doesn't have a need to fill this out. So if the seller does need to fill it out, if it's built 42, for example, I'm gonna email it to the seller uh, through the electronic signature platform, and they'll be able to fill that out, okay? Um, and so again, my environmental hazards booklet is very, very important. You, you must have these in there. Um, protect your family from lead in your home. So remember that um, lead paint disclosure form, the uh, LPD form that's required in all sales or rentals of property built pre-78? So that if the property's not built pre-78, you still have to do the protect your family from lead in your home. That's required by statute. So you still have to do that. A lot of people don't know this. Okay. And so I'm going to tell you, be careful, protect yourself, protect your broker, protect your client. Um, but uh, if it was built in 1986, you don't need the LPD because it wasn't built pre-78, but you do need to have the protect your family from lead. So you're going to select all. And if it's not subject to earthquake, then I could probably eliminate that. Um, and we're good to go. And the last page, by the way, is the signature page. And so, you know, this is going to uh, signature on, you know, whether or not you found it to be helpful. But this is the one that says I received a copy of all that happiness that I just showed you a second ago. Does that make sense? Okay, everybody, we're good. Questions? Any questions about any of that? I showed you how to create uh, how a created template looks. I showed you how to create one, and then I showed you how to apply one to a transaction that you were creating, but then also to apply it to a transaction you already had in progress. Okay, all right. So I showed you all that happy stuff. Let's uh, get us back to uh, uh, my PowerPoint. So we looked at all that uh, residential lease from month to month. We looked at that um, lease listing templates. I showed you how to create one. Um, and then I just I throw a little thing in here, short-term lease or rental agreements, why is CAR eliminating them? Mainly to protect us um, from being potentially complicit with the owner that doesn't pay the TOTs. That's all, I said that earlier. So uh, there it is in writing. Thank you for joining us. Oh, by the way, all of my videos I load up onto the uh, YouTube website, the new YouTube website. Question, did you show where to obtain the hazard flood disclosures in CAR? Um, yes, we looked at the tenant flood hazard uh, disclosure form uh, from CAR. So uh, form, again, it will be included in the lease agreement. Uh, so it, it'll be the, uh, the T tenant flood hazard. There it is. And, th and this is my uh, tenant flood hazard form, and this is included with the lease agreement, which is who it has to be included with. And this is the part that I talked about. I checked the box that says it's in the zone, right? Because they can't sue me if I tell them it's in the zone and it's not, but they can sure sue me if I tell them it's not in the zone and it is. Okay, good. Good question. Uh, thank you, Rico. Uh, what's this? Uh, Oh, thank you. That's really kind of you. I try to make these worthwhile. I really do. I, I, you know, you're spending two hours of your time with me. I know, you know, I ache for sitting for two hours. Um, uh, I have some disabilities that make that worse. So uh, I, I appreciate it. So we have a new YouTube website. Get your QR code reader ready. You all got them on your phone, right? Okay. Um, and I'm going to, uh, there it is. There's the QR code. You can either click on that. Okay. Um, uh, or you can go to at Burke Real Estate Consultants, Inc. And I do this because I wanted you to see that you should have uppercase where people can really make out what the words say rather than one long lowercase thing. Um, you've also got a bit.ly uh, link. Um, and by the way, I create these because um, I'm required to by the Department of Real Estate when I when I go to do the classes, I have to provide you with the forms to complete ahead of time, registering for the class, especially in our case, I suspect we're going to have a lot of people in the room. Um, and so uh, imagine, would anybody want to sit through five hours of me? Uh, 
I'm surprised at how many people are willing to. In fact, I was so honored when I set it in, the, the head of the program called me up from the Department of Real Estate and said, I'm really excited about getting to read your, your work. And I'm like, wow, that's so nice of you. I mean, you know, most people are afraid of the Department of Real Estate. Listen, I love the Department of Real Estate. <clears throat> Don't be afraid. They're there to help you. OK, they really are. Um, OK, please remember to like and subscribe. And so it tells me when people do that, you know, if, if you know, I don't make any money off of it. But the subscribe is a benefit for you because like tonight, when I load these videos up, it'll send you a notification that I've loaded new videos. OK, so like and subscribe. That'll get you the new videos. Uh, and uh, as always, please let SDAR know if there's anything that, that you would like to see. Um, we do go office to office, by the way. Um, I'm lining up classes now for the week of the 15th weekends, weekday, I don't care. Um, I'm going to be at the CAR meetings in Anaheim from the uh, what, 18th to the to whatever that Friday is, but then I'm, I'm back in San Diego the whole following week. So if your office wants me to do a presentation, let SDAR know, let me know, we'll get it all lined up, okay? Um, and uh, then we also have the weekly email updates. This guarantees you're gonna get into the class. Um, most of my classes today are webinars. The ones I'll be doing during September will be live in person. Um, but again, um, you know, uh, I don't put people on the list unless you ask to be put on it, but there's a link in all of them that that sets you up to get into the class. You don't have to read the thing that says the class is sold out. I want you in the class. OK, so that's what that's all about. Anybody have any other questions? I'm going to get you out of here a couple minutes early. I'm, I'm glad we got that done, but that was a lot of material to cover. I've actually officially been on the clock for well over two hours um, anybody, anything, seeing none, I see people dropping off. Uh, I hope you have a great day today and uh, uh, hopefully I get to see you again on Thursday. Uh, and as we always say, I look forward to seeing my hometown in Del Mar. I look forward to seeing you around the track. Thank you, everybody. Take care for now. Thanks for being here today. Bye-bye.